So I wanted to talk a little bit about some positivity that's going on um, for the planet. We always talk about how terrible things are going to get, especially when it comes to climate change and everything like that. And um, I found out about Earth Optimism Summit. Um, it's an event launched to inspire environmental solutions. So, you know, we were very uh, doom and gloom, um, but... They have uh, given the crisis facing nature. It's easy to give up hope, but as regular positive news readers will know, um, around the world there are many examples of people winning the fight to protect the planet. Um, they're bringing individuals together to learn about what's going on. Uh, going right in the world of conservation uh, is Earth Optimism, an online event that kicked off on this past Friday. Uh, it's featuring talks from progressive thinkers, or Earth Optimism aims to highlight solutions to pressing environmental problems and inspire people to become more involved in the fight to pr protect the natural world. Um, you know, that they they try to show that there is hope still um, for our planet and everything like that, for us to not give up um, on a lot of stuff that's happening. So I really wanted to just highlight this uh this website, they have a, a bunch of different um, stories that are popping up and that um, especially I think it's from until March 26th to April, April 4th, that they're going to be doing a bunch of seminars. It's all online stuff. So you can check out their website, uh, earthoptimism.cambridgeconservation.org. Um, they're going to have a bunch of different things going on. So that way people can kind of get involved because that's what they're aiming to do just get people knowledgeable about stuff that they can do um, to help with the environment, help make things a little bit better. Uh, Com Cambridge Conservation Initiative, it was a, um, it's an online ce celebration, bring people together and share our understanding of what works in conservation and how we can make the changes we know are needed on the ground, in the workplace, and in our everyday lives. So, I mean, I think that this is pretty cool. You know, we're always talking doom and gloom and they're kind of trying to bring a uh, silver lining and some hope to this this uh, situation that we're finding ourselves in. And hopefully that they can help to enact some kind of good that we can we can turn around and say, OK, this is great that they are helping for sustainability and everything like that when it comes to um, this planet we call Earth because we don't have another one. They're desperately trying to find one, but uh, <laughs> we've only got the one. And um, talking about positive news for the environment, they are actually, um, conservationists are creating a super highway for insects in the UK. So uh, outline in red is pretty much where they're going to be setting up um, large beds of wildflowers for bees and other insects to kind of start, especially major pollinators, to try to start uh, bringing them back. Um, we're very close to making bees extinct. So this was a um, huge effort to try to uh, preserve the bee population. Uh, roads and railways have made it easy to travel around the UK, but have had precisely opposite effects for the insects alongside housing develops, industrial sites, and farms, transport infrastructure has fragmented insect habitats, leaving many pollinators marooned on shrinking islands of biodiversity. So uh, the new pro conservation project aims to address that by creating a network of wildflower superhighways across the U UK. So it's uh, 10 years in the making. The Beeline Initiative was launched by the insect charity Bug Life on Tuesday and has already generated interest from unexpected quarters. So. I mean, this sounds pretty cool. Uh, I would love if they could try to start doing something like that, especially over in the U.S. Um, but I think more of our problem, especially in the U.S., is a lot of the uh, pesticides that we're using when it comes to our farmlands and everything, that it's really detrimental to the pollinators that we have. And um, yeah, I wanted to bring some, some hope to everybody that not everything looks screwed. We're, we're working on things to try to bring it back. That's awesome. We need that. Like you said, it'd be nice if it was happening over here more often, but, you know, <laughs> it's all right. You got to start somewhere. If things start working well in one location, it could develop somewhere else. That's 
they just need a proof of concept, right? Like, you know, if they see something's doing, you know, well in one place, chances are it'll develop in other places and people will fight for it, right? Well, the bees go, we go. That's yeah. that's that's the end all and, and be all of it. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Well, I'll add on to the the positive news stories for environmental news. Um, last week, the feeding of cows seaweed would cut down methane emissions by eighty two percent, said scientists. What? Oh, that's awesome! So they bit, yeah, they fed. Um, let me. See. Researchers who put a small amount of seaweed into the feed of cattle over the course of five months found that the new diet caused the bovines to belch out eighty two percent less methane, a potent greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. So over a long term, if if I, I, I don't know if like we can mandate that, but that would be a great change in the environmental, maybe even um, just incentivizing it, incentivizing you adding that to your feed would be mm. a positive note for us. Because unfortunately, we, we're a very uh, government or capitalist heavy country. So what's going to be the major is the government going to be like okay here's the incentive if you add some seaweed to your stuff we'll cut your and you you have it stated here we'll cut some of your cost or is it going to be these people doing it out of the goodness of their heart and let's just be honest it's not going to just come happen out of the goodness of their heart so but it's still a very positive story and also um the american bald eagle is making uh quite a like a return like they stated that they're doing very well for mm. an endangered species. So it's probably because we've been locked I down just for to add a year. Positive. <laughs> it's probably because we've been locked down for a year. We probably haven't been like you know affecting their habitats as much. Um, my question uh, regarding that, which is great. I mean, I'm happy you know for that. I think the environment was great while we were on the lockdown. You know, it looked beautiful outside and everything. Um, my question, um, camera, your camera. Um, oh yeah. Uh, is there, I was gonna say, um, weird. it's cool. Um, my question is, um, with the uh, with the whole seaweed thing, is it expensive to cultivate? Like, to for them to to do that? I mean, I understand there's like it might offset the cost of certain things because if it's helping the environment, it may create uh, some sort of offset somewhere. You know, that might be worth doing. But um, is it expensive to do that? Or you know, because you figure they gotta what pull it from the ocean, right? So. And is there is there a lot of seaweed I mean, in the ocean? I mean, seaweed is actually pretty. There's a lot of seaweed. Mm. Um, yeah, it's not it's not something, and it grows pretty fast. So, mm. it and we can actually farm it. That seaweed is something that we could actually farm in. Like, uh, I forgot what they're called. Um, just you know, you know what I'm saying. Like into the like water. It's like a water solution that basically yeah. you can just farm. It's just like when you're farming fish. So okay. that's cool. And they're yeah. able to digest um, it. Okay. Like we already feed cows corn and they can't digest that. We end up having like, we put holes in cows that we have to scoop out of their stomachs and stuff. It's <laughs> Come on, man, you send my hamburgers, man. It's still dis- <laughs> it's it's disgusting and it's awful for the cows. It's the truth, but I don't want to think but about But at that. the same time, it's like we, we use corn all the time because it's cheap and it's easy to feed the cows and they don't care making a hole in the cow just to make sure that they can take out the kernel part that doesn't dissolve in the cow's stomach so if this can dissolve better and they can actually digest it well without having to make a hole in the side of a cow that would be great so what i will say this is the only thing i can say because i can't obviously i obviously can't tell you a definitive but two years ago separate research by kibrib and roke found that the seaweed supplements reduced methane in dairy cows with a blind taste test of milk, finding that it didn't affect the milk output of the ruminants. Um, the latest research, this time on beef cattle, similarly found no difference in taste of the meat from seaweed consuming animals. So I mm. can't tell you that it has a different impact on the animal itself or not, but it shouldn't. It seems like that this is uh, so far been deemed safe and like they've been doing this study for at least five years, you know, That's at least good. five to 10 years, probably. That's good. That's good. I mean, I still think it's weird. We're like one of the only animals that drinks another animal's milk. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of, it's weird. Which is why I do not do it. <laughs> I mean, I love, I do. I'm lactose milk intolerant. Still. <laughs> uh, Rob I like found milk, out he's I lactose can't. intolerant. 
<laughs> Yo, man. Like I, the other day, I had a milkshake, man. Oh my god. I I love milkshakes too. That's a shame, but it's like I hadn't <laughs> drank milkshakes in a long time. I don't want to get too into it, but my stomach was like, <laughs> like I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. Yeah, no mas. He's cut down a lot on like cereal and stuff like that because he found out that he he's probably lactose intolerant. Yeah, but yeah, cereal. I mean, I, I still love like I like it. milk and everything, but you know, I it's weird when you start to think about it. Like we. We get it from another animal. And, you know, like, especially when they were talking at one point of um, trying to popularize popularize, uh, camel milk because it was better for you. It had, it was uh, more nutrient rich and and you were able to digest it better than cow milk. People were like, ew, camel milk. That's so weird. Why is it weirder than (laughs) than drinking milk from a cow? We went to the, remember we went to (laughs) the, um, yeah, remember we went to the cow farm? And we saw the cows or whatever it is, and um, your sister and them uh, bought gross. milk or whatever. Yo, I looked at the cows <laughs> like cows yo, was like, oh, it was, it was like his it nose was, was snotty and everything. Yeah. I was like, y'all and gonna drink that milk? I'm like, store yeah. and stuff like that. And they had like fresh cheese and fresh milks and all this other stuff. It was it was cool. It was cool, you know, to go in there and stuff like that. The but cows uh, are nasty up close. Super fresh. <laughs> super super fresh. They had, like these cheese curds. They were. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is snot, them things were some snotty looking like they not I don't know if they were well kept or not or whatever but if, if that's what a well kept cow looked like that cow looked like it was dying <laughs> man it's, it's it's was, did oh my not, God. Yo. I don't think Rob's seen a lot of cows I've seen cows but I, I yeah. well at least on yeah, TV they, from look, New York. they look they look like they're you haven't seen a lot of cows I don't know. I think the cows are lactose intolerant because they, they look... <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> cows do not get to drink their own milk for the most part. Oh, man, that was disgusting. Yep. That was disgusting. That's you actually one of the bigger p- the points. They don't oh. they don't even drink milk after they have uh, hit the gestation period. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So we're, yep. we're the weirdos here. Like milkshakes, <laughs> man. <laughs> milkshakes, man. <laughs> They're the best, though, man. I ain't gonna friend. I'm gonna still drink milkshakes, even though it kills me. <laughs> <laughs> you're so you're so you're Scully. So you're Scully from Brooklyn Nine Nine. You'll, you'll eat cheese no matter what. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was looking at like plant-based creamers. I'm seeing a lot more like plant-based creamers and more. Um, like almond milk and stuff like that, like substitutes, milk substitutes, you know, pushing people more towards like uh, plant-based um, food lifestyles, you know? And I mean, it's not a complete, um, it's not a complete like no for me. Um, I'm interested in it definitely because, you know, they said something like one third of our water is going to animals. It's going to the animals that we are cultivating for food, um, you know, cows and everything like that, and chickens, and they're drinking up a lot of the world's water. And if we all kind of shifted to more of a plant-based diet, uh, we could save a lot of our water, our fresh water, um, on this planet. I mean, that's that's a huge incentive. I I thought personally for myself, like that that would be great, because uh, fresh water is definitely we're depleting it very um drastically you know like texas is a desert and they import their water from other nearby states just for pretty much their cattle population uh otherwise they would be like texas would probably be a giant desert and there would be no green anywhere but there are draining water sources and huge um aqueducts underwater aqueducts um in nearby nearby states you know because of their cattle population that they a lot of our meat comes from there and stuff like that so it's something to think about i know a lot of people are like oh plant-based stuff but like the stuff they're coming out with now um even it's though there's no meat it does taste a lot like meat uh, which i think is helping a lot of people be able to transition to no meat diet i mean it's hard for me to like try to have a meal still without any kind of like protein that doesn't come from a meat product um but i think that's something that we should really try to think about moving forward in the future if we're really talking about um conservationists uh conservationism and you know trying to keep this planet going so can i talk about conservation in a much more uh, it's a very technical sense that the problem here too is that a lot of these ranch farmers cattle farmers 
are now large farmers. They're not small farms with a couple cattle themselves. They have mm -hmm. hundreds of pound, maybe even a thousand cattle. So it's literally created a business structure that can never work. So what happened? I don't know if we can. So no matter what, these farms are either going to have to change from the way that they're they're running and they're going to have to become open grazing farms they are going to have to like cut down their machinery stocks they're going to have to go to a model that doesn't go with the um the kind of dyson model of of making meat um and just basically putting people through the churning miles i mean mind you a lot of the meat that you're eating especially ground beef is a lot of rejected cattle basically that didn't make it into the dairy market um and or ones that you've basically milked so hard that you're basically making them have to make them into a cattle pr production so that's the hardest thing that we're going to deal with is that how do you change these farmers into farming vegetables or farming less meat and making less profit because they're going to make less profit and that's the hardest thing is uh forcing a business to say we're going to make less money yeah i, I think know, it's our growing the, seaweed climate change <laughs> you know, yeah. climate change no, and the they, water they, shortages a, there's rice. a lot of things there's a lot of things that um they gotta you know add to that equation you know if like they don't fix the environment they're gonna all right how do you you know not only deal with the you know the the cows and the meat and all that stuff how do you farm you know we, we got we, there's a lot of things that they got to um address and um i think if people were adults you know in our government and other governments and weren't all about capitalism they would um you know take a serious uh make a serious change in how we do things and kind of i wouldn't say force it on people but at least you know gradually implement it so that um you know things would get better but there's too much money, man. That the money is what's doing it. it. You know, like you said, if they're gonna lose a lot of money, and their investors are gonna lose a lot of money, you know, like, and who even knows if the ground um, that they have is like really fertile for um, a lot of the stuff that they would have to start growing now. You know, it's it's a it's a big change, man. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it would be, be like change. the beginning of yeah. uh, the pandemic. You know, with a lot of the meat. They had to throw out a lot of the meat because nobody was buying up the stuff, you know. Um, there wasn't the restaurants weren't able to be open. They weren't they weren't using all this meat, and um, a lot of it ended up getting thrown away, you know. Yeah. Even though uh, like the animals still had to get slaughtered, everything like that, and it was it was sad because they couldn't afford to feed the animals, so they couldn't keep them. But then they had all this meat that they couldn't sell either, so you know that was a huge loss that farmers took. Um, when it came to especially the pandemic, you know, and that was a hard look that they would have to face um, for what their business is too, you know, like this, the sustainability aspect of it. I mean, if we run out of fresh water, I, we're screwed when it comes to that. Any way you look at it, when it comes to the farmer side of it, um, whether you're, uh, you know, live animals or uh, produce it's just it, you're going to to take that loss too so i mean when we're looking at sustainability that is not a sustainable business it, it just isn't when it comes to what we're looking at with climate change and how the environment is and where the earth is heading uh we have to take these looks at maybe we have to start with ourselves and looking at what we can do to personally change um what we're doing that would be affecting the earth and how things are happening, you know, and if that means looking at more plant-based food, then maybe that's somewhere we need to start looking, you know, saying like, everybody's like, oh, don't take my steak. Don't take my hamburger. Uh, that stuff's not doing a lot for you anyway. You know, it's, it's not helping you. A lot of the times it's not helping your diet, um, an extra hamburger a week or anything like that, you know, but I think it's going to take businesses to start um, looking at meat substitute products. You know, if McDonald's can start getting a, like a, a meat substitute burger that they can put on the menu that people will start buying, you know, I think that's a start. That's somewhere that they have to look at, you know. 
but everybody's so obsessed with having meat and everything in their diets. And it's been such a, something that's been so ingrained in their lives. I know specifically I've, we've always had meat on the table, you know, and then looking at going to all plant based diet, it's, it's drastic, but we should look at it. We should look at it as a definite alternative, um, to what we're doing now. So what we're doing is not working. Uh, we're, we're burning, we're burning the candle at both ends and it's all going to come to a head soon.